So are the Celtics, Brendan, just staring us in the face as as the title favorite right now? Or should we just look at them as the as the the favorite to win the whole thing? I mean, not to, you know, I would never take a victory lap. But you, I think we did no. this segment like a month in where I was like, Celtics are the field. It just felt that way pretty early on to me. In the East, I think, was the context back then. I'm not ready to say that for the whole league. I think the West has a lot of, of teams. I, I'm certainly still there in the East. I'll, I'll, I'm not backing off that at all, but I think so. It would be kind of crazy to say anything else right now, right? Yeah. they The confidence they're playing with right now, the intention they're playing with right now, the, I mean, even just like honestly, the Jalen Brown like having fun at the fact that they left him open and like teasing that like speaks to just like I think how darn locked in they are right now, how deep they are at this point with all the the size and switchability at the guard spots they have. That's the thing that I'm glad it kind of jumped out to you too. But it's like for a team that that was already this far ahead and has such a track record for, I mean close to a decade now. I mean, Jalen is in year nine, I believe, or eight, and they've been good his whole career to even care enough to come out and like smash teams out of the all-star break like this. I mean, that in and of itself says a lot to me that they just, yeah, it tells you yeah. wanted to prove this and like came out with the requisite energy to do it. Yeah. hundred percent. It tells you there's intention. It tells you that there's some venom behind what they're putting out. Um, Danny Chow had this, in his blog at the ringer when I was reading earlier today, Brennan, before we recorded the Celtics right now have a point differential over this 11 game winning streak of plus 243. That is the largest point differential over an 11 game sample in league history. Mm-hmm. They are literally just shellacking teams <laughs> at all. <laughs> Stretch of the imagination. And like, the post all star break NBA is a weird place. It just is. Teams start to they have more games crammed in. They're looking ahead of the playoffs. They're thinking about health. Obviously, now we've had this rash of injuries in the NBA that has kind of I think thrown disrupted some things in, in slight ways. Boston is just unfazed by all of it. Like they're they're healthy. The only guys not playing for them are the, and or aren't listed as active for them are the guys that just don't matter for them, like the JD Davidsons and the Jordan Walshers of the world. They are just playing with like an obscene level of confidence and an obscene level of intent that, like, even if Milwaukee is showing some signs of, of being really interesting and, and they play in a couple weeks and I can't wait for that game, that the Heat are revving up, that the Knicks are still around, that the Cavs are, are still around, that like there are some good teams in the East that they're going to have to combat. It really just feels like I, I'm with you. I think this is, this is Boston's Eastern Conference to lose, barring just. Maybe some of the things that have plagued them in the past rear their ugly head again, and we end up being in the same place with them. But this this does feel different to me. This does feel like a, a Celtics team that has a little more weight behind what's thrown around here. And, and that, to me, bodes really, really well for them as we go the rest of the way. So I have a couple questions with them. One is about Brad Stevens. Okay. Because it kind of got me thinking, right? I think he's going to win executive of the year. Thought you're gonna be like Joe Joe Mazzula hanging out with Pep. Does he get in the Pep rub? I don't know if you saw this. Uh, no, I did not. But let me just tell you what I mean with Brad Stevens. I think he's gonna win Executive of the Year. Would you agree? I mean, if yeah, the which is which, which Dame like is one of those awards. Of... Maybe the Bucks, yeah. Would, but as of now, I think it's gonna be Stevens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably just because you, you could, but even though it's like, because because I mean, Porzingis and Drew Holiday are two of the most consequential moves that have been made in the NBA in the last 12 months. That's your argument. I mean, and he did them in the same season. So yeah, I think it kind of feels like he, he, it's his to lose. So there's one element of the question I'm about to ask that is a little dicey. It might not hold up, but how many people in NBA history have been in conversation as the best coach in college basketball, the best coach in the NBA, and the best executive in the NBA 
all the same person in one career, let alone, I mean, he's done it in like just over 10 years. He's checked all those boxes. The I mean, best coach Brendan, in the NBA uh, one is the part that might not work out, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just wondering if you're asking me in a roundabout way, if you're the GM of an expansion team and you have your choice of any NBA player or Brad Stevens, who do you choose? I'm just wondering if that's what you're, you're trying to ask me here. Shout out, Chris. Shout out to shout out to one of the all-time tweets, honestly. But no, and like, so to your like point. yeah, that that became a meme. So obviously, I don't know how many people really thought of him as the best coach in the NBA. No. at any point, I can tell you, like, uh, at least the, the, up there, right? Yeah, and and to your point, like, I I think he has just like accomplished a ton. It's very clear that he knows basketball just like at a at a level that is on par with some of the best in the league. I mean. We don't get these kind of like I, Brennan. Sometimes I wish NBA insiders would do some of the things that like Hollywood insiders do at times, which is like give us like the the power polls of like who's actually the most powerful people in in an industry, and the most like well respected thought leaders within these industries. And I would I would venture to guess that Brad Stevens is probably on like the top five of those lists right now. And on the men's side of the game, it's like him and Spo and Ty Lu and Pat Riley, and it's like. Like that's kind of like in the inner circle. He has to be considering everything he's done, everything he's seen. Certainly, like some mistakes along the way, but I think one of the the most brilliant things about it for him is that he's willing to evolve and he's willing to push things in different directions when he feels the need to. I think Brendan, lots of other general managers, if you want to go back to the summer and in his case as executive of the year, like wouldn't have traded Marcus Smart. Would have just been like, yeah, like that's that's a culture guy. That's like the heart of the team. We can't lose that guy. They've been better without him. And it's not that like they got rid of him and got better because they got rid of Marcus Smart. It's that they saw trading Marcus Smart as a catalyst to to evolve and get the team better. And then also, by the way, they're in good position as to bring a good true holiday for uh, from their vis-a-vis their biggest rival in the East. Like he has been so opportunistic in a way that I think a lot of GMs should look at and say, you can't be you at this NBA in particular, I think you can't be willing to just sit there and and let stuff happen. You kind of have to go out and, and make your own luck, make your own fortune. He's absolutely done that. So, yeah, I think he's absolutely got to be up there. It's one of the, the most respected people in the league right now. So that brings me to the other thing. I, th- I Is it fair to say the holiday thing kind of fell in their lap? Yes, but I, but I think, like too. Like, we would think about it differently if the Lillard saga didn't go the way that it did, and then they don't land holiday. Like, the version of this team that just has Porzingis but then still has an injured Robert Williams and whatever's going on with Malcolm Brogdon, that probably ends up feeling a little different to us. But I guess you can't take it away from them. No, but I mean, the, but, uh, but Brendan, I think even on top of that, the fact that they sent two firsts mm-hmm. for Drew Holiday, who are they essentially going to have to pay after this year, and yeah, weren't they went phased it. by They went for it. Not every team would have done that. I don't think every team in the yep. league in that position would have done that, and and they you I think when teams actively go all in and and push their chips in and pursue something like this, I think they deserve credit for actually doing it. And they're one of the few teams that I think actually would have had the gumption to, to really go through some to go through with the holiday trade. I don't think every team would have done that. No, I don't think so either. And but the old, the end result is to me, their their defense is better now than it was before. Even though yeah. we thought of that as maybe the thing they were like. Like, when they just had made the Porzingis trade, it was like, okay, they've acknowledged that their best player isn't going to be as good, and I want to get to him in a second, as the other team's best players. So they have to create a better infrastructure overall, so they're going to go get Porzingis, who's a little bit of a post option, uh, another shooter, and whatever. So that they can commit more resources to that end of the floor, and they're going to take a step back on defense. But then, because the holiday thing lands in their lap the way that it did, now I actually feel like they're better on both ends. They're just like substantially overall, no matter what way you want to slice it. I think a better team, and that's what makes me feel like they can get over the hump because it's it's not just can these guys get it done? It's can these guys and their two awesome new teammates who have raised their ceiling substantially get it done? And that's why I don't have any hesitation saying yes, because the version of this team we saw struggle to finish off the Warriors or get embarrassed by Miami last year, like that's not what this team is. 
they're flying around on defense. Holiday is just as valuable as he's ever been. I think there's an offensive level he could hit in the playoffs if he needed to that they just haven't had to ask him to do. And Porzingis, mm -hmm. if he can stay healthy, is awesome. I, I mean, he's been perfect for them. He, you and I both thought he should have been an all-star and, and everything else. So, yeah, I mean, you're talking about a team that's been a mainstay in the conference finals getting pretty substantially better. There's no reason, like, just kind of the trajectory of league history or whatever you want to say, there's no reason they shouldn't feel like a, a heavyweight, feel like a favorite. And two, I, it's going to, it's, they're, they're at the point where I just think they are going to, they are going to be the thing that everyone in the playoffs has to react to. There's only one, there's really only like two teams I can think of that I don't think have to like kind of adjust themselves to the Celtics in a real way. And that's the Nuggets and that's the Clippers and the Clippers is because of their personnel. And then it's the Nuggets because it's the Nuggets and everyone else I think is having to play the Celtics game. Like I, one of the real bummers for me this week, Brendan is I really wanted to see what the Cavs at full strength would have done against Boston just to see how they problem solve for it. Now I'm not going to get to see it in that game. The most exciting thing about Cavs Celtics on Tuesday is it going to be that the Kelsey brothers are going to be there drinking a shit ton of beer. Because it's Bob Kelsey Brothers bobblehead night at that game. That's the most exciting thing that will be happening at that game on Cleveland on Tuesday. A game that was flexed on a national television. Very tough for the NBA that they just, like, no one's healthy. It's very dumb. We've talked about that before. The, no, like, they are going to, every team is going to have to problem solve and panic and find solutions for them. That That is where, like, I, I was joking with about this before. And it's not so much, I think, that Missoula is, like, a coach on the level of Pep Guardiola. But like what Pep, what Pep does, and what like his teams have done, what the very very best teams in soccer do, and very few NBA teams do for structural reasons, I think more than anything else, is that they just kind of like the very best soccer teams, like Man City, dictate like a style of play, and then just like bend certain things to fit personnel, and like can swap things in and out, and do different things on a given night when they need to. Boston can kind of just be whatever it needs to be in that same way. They're overwhelming in certain areas, but then they also can just kind of do what they need to do and be malleable if certain things just need to go a certain way in a given game. Like that they are like I think Tatum to his credit at times like doesn't feel like a need in a way other stars do of try to score a bunch of points early. He's kind of willing to kind of get it let the get the game kind of flow and then he can come in later and kind of be the the hammer on top of of a start that already gets them out way ahead. Yeah, you and I debated. I think that was one of the things when we first had a conversation like this early in the season. You were kind of saying you felt like he was different. I was saying, like, show me where in the stats or what part of his game. And maybe we kind of agreed to disagree, but I think it definitely shows up now. So maybe that's uh, you taking a victory lap a little bit because, like, his drives per game are down a little bit but he's more efficient in terms of field goal percentage and fewer turnovers on those drives. He's improved his pull-up shooting percentage, uh, three-point shooting percentage by four percentage points. So it's gone from sub 30 to he's hitting a third of them. And you might be want that to be higher, but we were, you know, contested pull-up threes. Most of his pull-up threes are contested. Most of everybody's pull-up threes are contested. That's a pretty good number. 33 is fine. And then he's now at this point in the year with a pretty substantial sample, he's doubled his post-up frequency and maintained the efficiency. So I do think he's kind of growing out his offensive game in a way. It's like, yeah, you could look at him. He's 6'8", 6'9", you know, cut. Feels like he should be able to just be LeBron James or whatever. Downhill, not LeBron, but, you know, that level of physicality you would like to see. You'd like to see him try to be LeBron and, and get 70% of the way there, and, and you'll take that. But he's not going to be that kind of player. But I think that he's still developing out in a way that you feel like, yeah, maybe he's 5% better in a big, close game in a deep playoff round than he was last year. And when everything else around him is so much better too, again, you start to see the case for, yeah, it's not common for a team to win a title when their best player is maybe the seventh or eighth best player in the league. But when everything else clicks like this, it does happen. It's not that big of a fluke. You know, Dirk Nowitzki won a title in his thirties and obviously the Oh four Pistons, everybody talks about, and there's plenty of Kawhi in 2019, like 
maybe by the end of that, we thought of him as the best player in the NBA, but probably not at the beginning of that season, right? So it happens, and it happens because all the other stuff lifts that player and creates that structure, and I think that's what we're seeing with the Celtics.